everyone, it's Tasha D here, two-time Olympian and Olympic bronze medalist, and welcome to another episode of Global Sports Channel's Sports Personality Spotlight. Now today, I'm so excited because <laughs> I have someone for, for you guys. Y you don't know her, but I am loving this woman. I mean, I'm not kidding, so I'm just going to tell you it's going to be totally biased the whole <laughs> interview because I love this woman. She's one of my favorite people on planet Earth. She's had a successful career as an Olympic and world level athlete. So let's get chatting to Matt. Well, her friends call her Maz. So Maz, Marilyn Okoro. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, darling? Hey, girl. Hey. <laughs> hey. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just so excited. You can see from my teeth, my smile, everything. It's so good. To <laughs> I know. This is going to end up turning into a girl's chit chat, right? I know, but that's the beauty of track and fields, you know, so I'm so Exactly. Excited. We get friendships for life. It just comes as part of the package, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so what are, you, what, are you, what are you up to? Where, where are you right now? Well... I got such a question <laughs> loaded. <laughs> um, I'm currently coming to you from Wigan, which is near Manchester, uh, northwest England to be precise. Yeah. But I'm a Londoner, North Wheezy. <laughs> so you live in it? You uh, living in Wigan right now? What's, what's, what are you doing over there? Oh, I don't know. How did I end up in these streets? <laughs> no, <I'm laughs> I did. Two years ago, I came up to continue training with a good rival of mine, turned um, friend oh, Jenny Meadows. Yeah. Nice. Um, so her husband was coaching me for a while um, and then I started working with a charity called The Brick and we support the homeless community here or people in wow. crisis and I just got sucked in and it was meant to be like my side hustle, we pay the bills <laughs> and now yeah. I'm full time health and crisis coordinator what? but you know got to pull it back because you know I did come to run and I'm sort of not doing that anymore it's really weird but um I my ambitions are now to head back to London and see what life after sport has for me wow I mean we're I'm, we'll we'll go on the journey and we'll get to how you got to where you are today but I'm so happy for you because I you know I've watched your career obviously sometimes side by side sometimes from afar and I know it's not been easy so we'll definitely talk about that but you know what I found out while I was doing a little stalking of you. You know four languages. How did I know you all this time and not know that you know four languages? <laughs> when the heck did you get time to know four languages? <laughs> what? Well, two of them are cheating because actually my first language was Igbo. I'm um, right. from Nigeria, so that's our tribe. So right. you just come out so the world speaking the package, right? <laughs> And then my mom sent me to school at three to learn English. She's like, hey, I had you in London. You better speak English. <laughs> and then <laughs> at school, I just love languages. So I did French and Spanish. And right. I'm fluent in French. And I'd say I'm more conversant in Spanish because I didn't really yeah, continue it. Didn't you do a degree in French and French yeah. and politics? Oh, bloody hell. Well, I lived I, in Paris for a year, which was amazing. <laughs> you're making me feel like I haven't been living. <laughs> <laughs> girl, you're living in LA, girl. That's <laughs> true. But um, the other thing I do know, though, is that there's a very special man in your life right now. He may have four legs, but he is a very special man. <laughs> talk about like, Jesus. Talk about my fur, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't no other man in my life but Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> when did Bentley get come into your life, and 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 why? What what? Because most people have a story around why they get a little fur baby, and especially if they're still competing, it's a big responsibility. How did um? How did you end up with your little baby? I love that you asked me that because he is like so important to my journey right now. So yeah. me, you've known me my whole career, but as you know, I came out to California and spent four and a half years in the States and I was living in Florida for the majority of that. And whilst in Florida, one of the, I was director of ops for U UCF, Bill Knights, <laughs> and one of the softball players had this Pitbull Rottweiler mix puppy that just came over to me and just did not leave my side. Um, so she was like, my dad says I need to get rid of him. I was like, well, I'll have him. And that was Rocco. So that was my first fur baby that was in my life. Right. And thankfully I had to leave him behind. Oh. And I always said, oh, you know, when I'm settled back in the UK, when I retired, I'm going to get another dog. But two years ago, I was just in such a low place, really miserable. So I started researching like, um, rescue dogs and right. I put my name down for a little sausage that was one called I think she was called Coco however by the time they got around to me they were like oh she's be home that's great so I was like right. okay well. 
So as you know, the other thing we share is our singing. So I was singing at my friend's wedding and her cousin was called Jet. And I was like, that's a cool name. And just talked to her as off, probably a bit yeah. of a Prosecco <laughs> And I did her on Instagram. And literally the next week, I saw these beautiful puppies on her Instagram. I was like, I need that one. He was the only black and tan one in the litter. His little face looked just like Rocco when he was eight Aww. weeks old. And she was just like, you've got to have him. And that was how Bentley came into my life. And, you know, oh, we've been at the hip ever since. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And you say that you were in a low point. Did, did that having Bentley in your life really have a big effect on that? Absolutely. You know, it's we're not a big um, pet family you know I, I have yeah. I'm not scared of animals or anything like that but it's just not really what we did so my mom was just like please have a real baby however you know <laughs> Bentley, he has he's my angel I call him and I was officially I guess diagnosed with depression two years ago and I didn't really recognize it myself and I didn't want to do anything I didn't want to get out of bed I didn't want to shower I didn't want to do anything I didn't want to see anyone but you know once I had him I had another focus, I had unconditional love, um, and he just made me laugh. I, I just sit here and laugh with him. <laughs> and oh, you, know, you can imagine how much that's amplified now in lockdown. Um, yeah. Obviously I'm looking a lot better, but you know, the focus is off me and my wallowing, and I've actually got someone else to, to focus on and to lift my spirits, and just to know that I'm important to him as well. <laughs> so, right, right. Yeah, I think it's that amazing. Is it. I think that is one of the things about going through mental challenges because as you know I've had my fair share of really low moments and I think that having that other focus can be really really huge whether it's a you know other an organization where you're looking out for other people or like you have a little loved one in your life I think it's a huge thing what what brought you to that place two years ago where things weren't you know, things weren't going well on the mental health side of life. Do you know what? It's I just this morning, it's just so lovely how everything comes together. But I've just finished my mental health first aid course and they asked Yay! me to share. <laughs> <laughs> they asked me to share why I was so passionate about doing the course. And I'd said it was a game changer for me. And I was just so shocked how two years ago I did not realize I was in a crisis. And now working with people that are, you know, in the midst of crisis or transitioning through homelessness, I'm super, super aware, but also I'm aware of myself, what my triggers are. And, you know, I think leading up to that, it was just, I grew up in a lot of dysfunction. So a lot of dysfunctional patterns to me were just norm. Right, <laughs> um, right. And, you know, I've been, you know, all throughout my athletics career, random people would say, oh, you're so crazy. You're the crazy one, whether it was based on me speaking my mind or how I raced the 800. And, you yeah. know, it's kind of, you have to be very careful about the language. So, you know, I used to be like, yeah, I'm crazy. I'm what? But um, I think for me, I was just dealing with a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. And I just assumed it was what it was it was the job, it was the nature of the beast, you know, right. keep pushing, keep pushing. And I was yeah. just literally pushed myself too far and, and didn't have the coping skills to deal with it and didn't have um, the people that would have recognized that in me around me. I was isolated. Right. I just moved yet again. And there were a lot of things I was jumping from or running away from and hadn't really resolved them or dealt with them. So it was literally like a sit down moment. Right. <laughs> and um, it's, it was a really difficult place to be in, but thankfully I've come through it. And again, mental health, it's a continuum. It's, you know, it's, it goes rounds and ups and downs and it's just learning to be more robust and having that compassion for yourself and others. Right. Were you, the things you were running from, were they sports related or personal life related or all of the above? Like what, how, what was it pushing you in that direction? A bit of both, absolutely. You know, I remember having a session with the very first sports psychologist I ever worked with, and I won't mention names. <laughs> Bless <laughs> they tried, but they were like, you know, I can't deal with anything off of track. Wow. And for me, I just thought, well, you can't help me. Um, and right. so I was like, put off that for ages. And later on, I did meet a guy called Donovan who was a CBT therapist, and that helped massively because he actually gave me some practical tools and we looked at why I reacted the way I did. But um, I just think 
you know, I've been so resilient, so resourceful and just done a lot on my own. So I had, you know, relationship breakdowns. I was trying to be the best 800 meter runner I could be. And then there were these hurdles that would come in my way. I needed, needed your skills there, um, whether it's the loss of funding or drugs in sport um, and just literally the sheer physical stress I was putting my body day in, day out. It all just caught up with me and I struggled a lot with chronic pain. And I don't think any of the injuries I had were necessarily like major ones. They were just sort of overuse, overwear. And, you know, and I'm someone that because I ran the four and the eight in the UK, no one really knew you know, what training I should have been doing. And right. you know, at the other end of it, I think it's it's really not rocket science, guys. <laughs> but right, right. we made it so complicated and no one understood me. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a 400 meter runner and an 800 meter runner. Bam. Right. Right. You know, everyone was like, pick, which one are you going to do? You can't do too much endurance. You just do 200s every day. And inside, I was in such turmoil. <laughs> right, right. And I think that uh, uh, can be a really misunderstood part of how an athlete functions is how much our sport overlaps with our life. Like if something's going on at home, it can affect us in, in our sport. Like you can't separate, like you have a sports psychologist that says, listen, I can't deal with what's going on in your life. Well, that's me. Yeah. That's why I'm, I am the way I am. So I think yeah. that's, you know, a really important thing for people to recognize and identify because even our childhood and, and how, who we are and why we are the way our, why we are the way we are, affects the way we compete because it affects the way we think like you said you get called the crazy one i mean i've heard that a million times <laughs> i claim it boldly <laughs> but but now looking back for people coming through because this is something i think about a lot because it helps me make sure that i don't go back down the depressed um suicidal mode is being able to understand what happened how did i get down that road and how can I avoid going down that road again? How, looking back now, how can, how can someone identify? Cause that was, that was the huge thing for me as well. I did not know I wasn't in crisis. You know, you just feel like you're upset about stuff, but you are in a crisis. And by the time you figure it out, you're knee deep, neck deep in it. So how can someone who has never experienced it start to recognize the signs that they need to do something and do something fast to not go down that stressful road. So I think I know when I start getting, um, call it antsy, you know, I, my mood just changes like mm. so quickly. And I'm, you know, everyone knows me as smiley mares and I'm really like jovial. And, you know, it's almost like one second I can be that the next second I'm really angry and I don't really like being angry it's not something I feel like I uh, an emotion I identify with easily so then yeah. and it can be over such a little thing um to just really low you know so right. when you're having those constant mood swings it's it's not just your period right. <laughs> if you're female because right. yeah. um, that's when I get cold um also just you know inability to sleep like oh my gosh just insomnia is it and you need to sleep that's like it's for your immunity it's for your training um but I just couldn't sleep and I was still going through my days like that so that is a telltale sign and then for me my social butterfly I didn't want to pick up my phone to anyone I didn't want to see anybody that is a red like warning sign red flags right there I could easily just stay in my flat for hours on end Days. And you know, binge watch Kardashians, but you know, that's another. That's another story. <laughs> um, you know, that was really unusual for me. Like, I'd watch my phone ringing, and yeah, stop. Thanks. I could even turn my phone off. Um, right. So yeah, yeah, those were <laughs> quite a few signs. Sorry. Hey Bentley. Um, in there. <laughs> you know, I, I I can totally relate relate to everything you mentioned. The insomnia. You know, not wanting to go out like you, very bubbly people person. And I think those are definitely, everything you mentioned is definitely stuff that people want to look out for. Mood swings, if you're not your normal personality, <laughs> if you're not your normal um, self in terms of the way you interact, what you're doing on a daily basis, if you don't, if you stop loving to do the things that you normally do, those are, like you said, a huge, 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 huge red flag. But I struggled with, because of who we are as athletes, we're supposed to be superheroes, right? So one of the things I struggled with was the courage to talk about it, to bring it up. Once I did figure out I am down, 
creek with a paddle with, a, with no paddle right and <laughs> and, then, and then when I did because of my personality which I know you may have experienced as well because you're very bubbly everyone was like oh you're Tasha Danvers you'll figure it out you're strong you're you're now they just kind of blew me off and I never at that point I didn't want to talk about it anymore because it had taken me so much courage to even mention it how did you find the courage to start seeking help and how can people push themselves to to get the help that they need oh you just just hit it on the head there um so for me very very similar one I think inherently in me I, I didn't really want to ask for help just because I've been burnt so much and mm. struggling with different kind of exposing myself and being vulnerable. So I was just like, I've got this, you know, I've got an S on my chest and like my whole life. Um, the people that I feel like I could have spoken to were so far away and it was almost like, oh, I don't want to burden them. I don't want them to worry about me. Um, and I don't really have that kind of relationship with my family. Well, I didn't then, I do now. Um, so, for me, it was actually recognized in a complete stranger. Um, I had been training in Trevor's group for a few months. Um, so I think it's like I joined in the September and I really had my first episode in the January. And she's actually a pain nurse. And so this is how I was not going to get past it because the other thing I was going to put, put in there was pain. And I just had chronic pain, you know, and it's, oh, it's the hamstring, or it's the Achilles, or it's the calf. And I'd go to physios, professional, you know, experts in their field, and they're like, Marin, there's nothing wrong with your muscle. I'm like, what are you telling me? I'm having, I know there's something wrong with my, <laughs> I know my body. And they're like, well, this scan here is telling us there's nothing wrong. And, you know, just stretch, eyes. And I was yeah. just getting sick of those diagnoses. I was not going to physio anymore. So she was doing some acupuncture because she's doing acupuncture course. And she was very clever, you know, just with these things, it has to be on your terms. You have to be comfortable. Her husband's a GP. Um, so they actually would invite me to their house most weekends and she'd do a session for me and then I'd stay for Sunday roast. And that was so nice. And they had a dog. I didn't have Bentley at the time. Um, and we'd just be talking and talking. And then she noticed that I, I was still training, but it was so hard to get out the door. Like Tasha, I was just like, the thought of going for a run was like someone put an elephant on my head. Um, so she would meet me on a Monday morning and just say, you know, if you want to run, we'll run. If you don't, you don't. And I just remember just one Monday, I just broke down because I was just, I literally, I'm so tired. And she's like, well, you know, it's, it's, this is what she could see in me. Right. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where it happened. And she's like, do you want to talk to my husband and just get it from a professional? Because it was almost like, I just wouldn't believe it anyway. Right. And I needed him to say, if you had walked into my clinic, I would say, this is what you're experiencing. And I, you know, I told him about the things I've been dealing with. And he's like, this is a whole lot. <laughs> like you don't have to be superwoman. Right. You've had so many changes. You've had breakdown of relationship engagements at that matter. You know, I've just come out of an abusive relationship. So there was loads of things. I have no money. Money has always been the stress of my life. And I literally had spent everything going out to America and came back feeling like, what was all of that? <laughs> right, so, right. you know, and that was really powerful for me that, you know, she recognized that in me and just sort of orchestrate very gently, very compassionately, very, you know, just let it be on my terms. And then I thought, okay, something is not right. And let right. me sort this out. I just wanted to function again. Right, Even right. if track, I just wanted to function and feel peace again. Yeah, because that's one of the things when you get into that state, you just can't see an end. Like, you don't, when is this going to stop? When am I going to stop feeling so terrible? Because you almost, even though you know why you're upset, you don't know why you're feeling this way on a day-to-day -day basis and why you can't dig yourself out of the hole. So it can be really stressful. What did you do? What kind of things did you do once it was identified? Because that's a true blessing that you had someone there that could, you know, really reach out and give you some advice in that department which you took which a lot of people would be scared to because you have to admit you know that they're right and you're not feeling good and it's not right um but you admitted and and 
it meant that then you could go down a different path. What kind of things did you do to feel better and get better at after that point? Because that was one of the things I was scared scared of. Once the doctors diagnosed me with depression, it was like antidepressants. And, you know, my mum is, oh, no. <laughs> my mum is Jamaican. It's like, <laughs> coming on to that. <laughs> she's very helpful. Yeah. She's just like, no, yeah. you're not taking those, those drugs. And, and I did end up taking antidepressants, but it was because I got to the point where I couldn't pull myself out. I knew I couldn't do it. I couldn't get myself to eat right. Couldn't get my, like you, the thought of going to training, you know, and when everything has been provided for you to succeed, like you have a great coach, you have the the, the finances to, to buy, you know, good, decent shopping and you're not eating, you're not eating right. And it's like, okay, I can't do it. I can't get myself enough energy and enough desire to get myself out of this hole. So what 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 was the next step once you identified where you were at? So I went to see the GP and, you know, we had a discussion about antidepressants and I let him just, I was pretty numb in the set. I just like, you know, whatever you say, doc. And then I got them and they sat there for a while. And I just had all this anxiety about, oh, I've got to take these drugs. What's everyone else going to think? You know, I had someone I, I confided the first one of the first people I confided in who's, a, you know, someone from church. And she was just like, why do you think drugs is the answer? Um, oh, but God. fortunately, also in this training group and, you know, as much as I have so much respect for Trevor and Jenny and it's a shame that, you know, I wasn't it wasn't to be. But the community I had around me, you know, I feel like I was, you know, God was really had his hand on that because I also had a counselor in the group, Bernie, she was phenomenal. And she just in her own time would just meet with me and talk. And, you know, I brought up the subject about I've got these antidepressants, but I can't take them. I should just be praying. And, you know, when my circumstance change will be fine and I'll just go for the talking therapies. And she said, listen, Marilyn, if you go to the physio because that hamstring of yours is hurting and they tell you you're going to take these Celebrex or, you know, you're going to do this laser, you wouldn't question it. She right. says, right now, your mind is fractured. Your mind is hurting and it needs time to heal and recover. And, she, you know, she asked me, about, told me about different options that he'd given me. The one that I had was really going to help my symptoms. And it's, right. you know, certainly it's good for sleep, you know. And she said, if anything, you know, you might just need to go up one or two doses but that's it. And you're in control. Remember that. Right. Just make right. sure that, you know, you know, I was like, how long am I going to have to take them for? And she was just like, you might take them for six months. You might take them for the rest of your life. But don't think that far ahead. Right now, this is what the professional is prescribing. And this is what's going to help you get back to where you want to be. So after that physio analogy, I just thought, you know what? As an athlete, I went think twice <laughs> about popping that <laughs> or so getting that epidural. So this was going to help me get back right. to being me that's what right. it took and I had to silence all those you know the cultural noises and it was hard it was really hard but it was what I needed to do for me and throughout this process I had to remember that this might be one of the first time in my whole life I'm actually just doing what I need to do for me right right you know it reminds me especially on the spiritual side that pressure to you know like you said just pray just pray, you know, but, but I, it reminds me of this little story. I don't know if you've ever heard it of the guy who's drowning and, uh, <laughs> you know, helicopter comes and says, you know, come on, get in the helicopter. He's like, no, 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 God's going to save me. You know, a boat comes along. He's like, no, 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 God's going to save me. Keep going. You know, a guy with a, a dog comes by. He's like, get on, you know, get on my back. I'll save you. He's like, no, 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 God's going to save me. And he drowns and he goes up to heaven. And he's like, um, God, I was there drowning and you didn't save me. What happened? He's like, dude, I sent you a boat. I sent you a helicopter. I sent you a dog, a log. What, do you, what more do you want? So it's like sometimes the answer is there, but because of our culture, because of our history, because of traditions, we may push the answer away that we need at that time. So, you know, to have the courage to stand up and do what you need is, is huge because, you know, you're a selfless person. i you know that's something that everyone should know about you is that you're a very selfless person so you tend to put everyone else first so to hear that you know you had that courage to do that at that time is huge and I think there's a lesson for others who will you know mental illnesses doesn't stop 
<laughs> right? It's, it's always going to be someone going through it. Yeah, so it's, it's a great lesson for people to, to, to learn from your experience, especially in that sense, because there is so much pressure. Now, we talked about how, you know, who you are and what's gone on in your life brought you to where you were. Tell us about your upbringing, because it wasn't all, you know, unicorns and glitter and rainbows. You, you know, you, you and, and some of the things that you do now or have done are because of what you went through, like the, your, the organization that you work with for the fatherless and things like that. So you went through those experiences. Tell us about your upbringing, because what I think people need to understand is how that shapes who you are. They don't get to see that. They just see the two seconds you get interviewed after the race. <laughs> And, and and you training and that's it. Who is Marilyn? Who? How did she get to where she is? What is your upbringing? I know, right? That's why I eventually agreed to go up to 800 because it was at least two minutes. I'm like, I need <laughs> you know my time to shine. Yeah. <laughs> 100 meters is too, too short. Um, yeah, so trip down memory lane. I grew up in Northwest London, an area called Stonebridge. Rap, rap, rap. No, what, what? that's not <laughs> <laughs> people always go stonebridge um oh yeah life was i was a very lonely child i had a lot of traumatic things happen early uh the first of which was going into care at seven so the event that led to that is traumatic but i was in foster care with some beautiful family um and they were from Barbados and it was just amazing and they really nurtured me. But more so it was the experience I had with my foster dad, who's passed now, bless his soul. And it was the first time I lived with a man and had a dad, I, you know, and he showed me what a dad was and who a dad was. And right. I've just held on to that inside for ages. Now, my 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 real dad, he's always been in America, bless him. Um, we, we don't have a very close relationship. It's a work in progress. Right. Um, but he's not been there, you know, and that's 36 years now. Um, right. Big thing he did do for me was to send me to boarding school. So I will forever be grateful. You know, that was always part of the plan. And that boarding school was about 40 minutes away from London, Hertfordshire, Hemel Hempstead. And again, that environment was just so blessed. 180 in the whole school. That's unheard of. So right. 20 in a year. So it was a really tight knit community. And for, you know, for some reason, out of all those people, there was about 10 black girls, which is a lot in that right. sort of context. Yeah. I felt like when I was in year seven, I had like sisters that, you know, so I, by the time I got to year 11, I was the only black girl in the school, but I, I didn't notice it. And that's where running, um, you know, became a thing. I loved a game called lacrosse. I played that. I thought I was going to be a lacrosse superstar, which you know, <laughs> is not a cool thing. But that's where I met my first coach, George Harrison, who is just incredible. You know, he really saw that I had talent, but also saw that I needed the opportunity and I needed that support. You know, he was the, right. the level leveler for me. And he knew both sides of me. He knew that uh, during exit out or half term or end of term, I was going back to Stonebridge. Um, it took a little bit of <laughs> working out because obviously I train really hard and be really fit and conditioned in the term time. And then I go home. My mum was like, "Running where? I beg, read your book." Um, so I could get so unfit, you know. And our holidays were long, so yeah. I come back, you know, full of belly, full of pounded yam and jollof rice, and people were like do you just not really take this seriously? And I was just like, I do, Georgia. And I'll be killing myself across country to try and, you know, get fit again. And he was like, okay, right, I'm going to, you need to come training in the holidays. And I was just like, to, you know, to any normal kid, that's like so normal. And I was just scratching, sweating. Mom's not going to let me go. So trying to pluck up the courage to say, this man is going to take me to training. Oh, you should have heard mom. She, she laughs about it now, but she put me through some stuff. So she was scared, you know, at the end of the day, yeah. I, we didn't even go out on the streets, you know, we played out in front of our front door, but other than that, I wasn't, it was just about getting your education, becoming a lawyer or doctor and, you know, making your parents proud. So George, I remember the one time he actually was taking me to physio and I needed to go to physio. So I just thought, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm not going to tell her and he's going to rock up. So let's see. <laughs> <laughs> you could have got that man killed. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Almost. So I remember saying, oh, yeah, I think I'm supposed to go physio today. So you think? I was like, yeah, like in 15 minutes. 
Um, and George knocked on the door. Hello, Mr. Coro. She's like, hello, who are you? And uh, he was like, I'm George. I've come to take Marilyn's physio. So like, you've come to take my daughter away. She started screaming. The whole street was oh looking. You'd think God. that he had, you know, done something terrible to me, you know? Yeah. Me, get upstairs. She's just shouting it and shouting him. And then George just left. And then he called me later. He said, Marilyn, I see. I see what you've been dealing with. You are one strong lady. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to call and tell me, you know, you're never training. He's never training me again. But um, after that, he made you know, huge strides to make sure that I didn't um, give up or get, you know, lost. <laughs> and, you know, things like he called my school, he explained, you know, the levels that, you know, my mom just didn't understand. They invited her to school for a meeting. They were all there and explained to her that, you know, I'm doing extremely well at school. And it's actually part of being a well-rounded individual. And it was part of the school ethos and building confidence and, who knows, you know, where our passions lie, but when we find them, it's important to nurture them. So, you know, my mom was just like, she had to eat a bit of humble pie, but she's never wrong, of course. Um, <laughs> so her, the bargaining started there and she was like, as long as you get, you know, all A's, A star, you know, just you know, a little bit of a high standard, um, you can do this running thing. So that's how it was. And, you know, I think the first time she properly saw me run was the Olympics on TV. Wow. Um, it, for her, it wasn't a thing. It was like when you when you when you decide to, to get a proper job, let me know, kind of thing. But then when Olympics, she was like, "Oh, my daughter, woo, champion sprinter, the <laughs> <laughs> Joker." She oh loves it God. now. Um, but that was my introduction to it. But I have so much I owe to the education system and the schools that I went to and the teachers that I had, you know, and George my first role models, but they essentially gave me the confidence to just be me. And that running was my thing. And I just literally ran with it, I guess. <laughs> wow, literally, <laughs> literally ran with it. I love it because, you know, I, I, I'm from England, but my parents are Jamaican like you, but, um, you know, our parents are from elsewhere, but I do know from observation that education in an African family upbringing is number one. Like anything else, it's a joke. Don't come to me with no singing career, no track and field career. That's for, you know, on your Saturday afternoons, if you've done your homework. So the pressure, to, yeah, you know, so that's a big deal that, that, you know, you were going down that road for your, for your mom. So the fact that, you know, eventually she came around and I love it. She's like, oh, my daughter. She's, she's it's the first thing she says now, like, Oh, this Amazing. is my daughter, she's a champion sprinter. She doesn't even know what event I do, I don't think. <laughs> Speaking of events, how did you gravitate? Because like you said, the 4-8 the specialty is not common. It's usually a 2 and a 4 or a 1 and a 2 or an 8 and a 15. How did you end up being straddling those two events? Kicking and screaming. <laughs> 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 so in my head I thought I was going to be a 200 meter sprinter I'm not going to lie like in my head woo, just love it it's in speed um but you know like I said I played lacrosse and George was a cross-country coach and he was probably just like what do I do with this kid like she can run fast and she can keep running she gets a bit tired but then she can go again um and that you know I think I owe that a lot to my athleticism and all the other different sports that I did. I was a tennis player, netball and lacrosse. So that's a lot of um, speed endurance. Yeah. Um, I think that just married nicely into the way George had me train. He'd throw me in with the boys. So I wouldn't be doing like the entire bit of their session. I'd be jumping in and they'd have to chase me. So I think when I was about sort of coming up to junior level, I ran the 300 and I was horrible at the 300. I was like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, sort of getting, coming last at English schools. And then the next year it was like the 400, that extra 100 makes a big difference because all those girls that were whooping me, I was now whooping them. Right. And I love that last 100, you know, because, oh yeah, it was just amazing. So I was like, I'm a 400 runner. This is my thing. And then I started, you know, researching 400 and it's just a beautiful event to watch. Um, and then George did this thing and he took me down to Watford and chucked me in an open meet 
and I had to run the 800. And you know what, there was men in there, I was like, I like beating guys, and I was just, you know, ticking it off, doing my thing. Yeah, yeah. And I ran 207. I think my quickest time before that was like a really laboured 216. Yeah. So he was like, and that young lady is why the 800 is now your event. <laughs> I knew that before. I would have just, you know, slowed down a little bit. But um, yeah. actually, I thought that was such a fun race. I still went through in 60 seconds and then whatever happens, happens. <laughs> right, right. Um, but no, I really enjoyed it. And I thought, oh, gosh, because if he'd have told me before, no. no, my head was gone. But um, right. it was fun and I loved picking off, you know, people and just that that last 50 metres where you're just like, am I going to make it across the line or not? I don't even know. <laughs> right. I have a slight impression. I feel like I, if, if I could have my time again, I definitely would have asked you to teach me how to hurdle and would have tried the four hurdles. That would have been interesting. Hey, listen, yeah. we're still young. We might be able to still try that. <laughs> just like, like, okay. today. I just went for a walk today and I was going so <laughs> I'm not hanging off to the wall after I go up the stairs. <laughs> like what happened? Do you know what it is though? Because I see you like work out and you're looking good and everything. And I think because I've just retired, I'm in rebellion stage and I just don't want to do anything. Like, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah, Where's I my red wine? Stage. I completely went through uh, that stage. And the weird thing was when I went through that stage, I had been asked to ca like climb Mount Kilimanjaro. So you'd think I'd be like, okay, well, let me try and work out. Like, I did not work out. Woo! I was just like, I'll get up there if I get up there. I was eating. I was whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. Some days I'd have McDonald's for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> I oh, mean, I was totally rebelling. Because when you do this for 20 years, everything's regimented. Your social life, <laughs> your food. I mean, it's a lot. So you just get out and that's why so many athletes you know we we get a little spongy and fluffy you can see my cheeks girl it's been a month i'm gonna, I'm gonna slow my roll but at work everyone's just like should you be eating that and the more people say that to me i'm like watch me exactly exactly i mean should you be eating that shouldn't you be taking the stairs no <laughs> <laughs> no i should be eating this and i'm taking the lift okay Oh my gosh. Now, yeah. speaking of coaches, coaches have had a huge influence in our lives, especially because we spend so much time with them and they have a huge influence on how our careers go. What's your coaching journey been like? And, and you know, how does someone identify a good coach? Because there's some really crappy ones out there, like, let's be fair, right? And sometimes it's hard to know when you are with a good coach or a bad coach and you're like, hang on a minute. I might need to get out of here. But, you know, we have this loyalty as athletes that maybe I just need to give it another uh, season. Maybe I just need to, you know, wait a bit longer because one of the athletes was successful. What's your journey been like with coaches and how the heck do you find one that works for you? <laughs> you saw my face change when you asked that question, right? <laughs> no, so the thing is, you know, I have had quite a few coaches. So, um it's definitely been a huge part of my my journey and I reflect on that a lot I people always say oh you're gonna when you retire you're gonna be a coach and initially I'm just like no I'm not trying to mess up someone's life <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm allowing the negative aspects um to impact that but you know I've done I'm doing a lot of work on this now and I'm passionate about leadership um you know why do people want to lead and what makes a good leader um and, you know, I have amazing, like my first coach, I just told you, the memories are amazing. However, I'm also really passionate, like yourself, in transition. And, you know, we are advocates for supporting athletes transitioning out of the sport and through the sport. And there's a lot of transitions that happen through your career. And for me, they, they weren't smooth. It is difficult because it's a period of change and flux. But I think they could be smoother. And your coach that you have has a huge impact on that. So for me, it kind of went wrong from the get-go. So I had George from age 10, you know, right up until just before I made Beijing, um, or my first sort of major champs, which was actually the Commonwealth Games in yeah. 2006. And obviously, like, no one batted an eyelid at me. They were just like, oh, let's see what she's going to do. You know, 207, that's great. But, you know, she's got to get down to 203, got down to 203. Oh, that's great, but she's too big to run two minutes. You know, so we plugged away and, you know, it was off like 
just two sessions a week and all my other sports, just big, big upside. But no one was seeing that. They were just questioning, like, you're not the, the what we're expecting. <laughs> right. And so I guess Ayo had seen that in my 400, that this could translate into a great 800. And um, he came to visit me at uni and it was all just exciting. I was like, oh, I'm going to be a pro. Wow. And, you know, you get the glitz and the glamour thrown at you. And I owe so much to AO. I have so much respect for him. Bless his soul. Um, but it was the beginning was not great. And it set the precedent for, you know, already I found it difficult to communicate with people in sort of, I guess, in a sort of authority to me. Um, so I feel like I was prized away from George a little too early. Mm. And I think that transition could have been helped with them working together and collaboratively initially, and then transitioning over to a more professional lifestyle. Um, whereas it was kind of a yank, okay, you're doing this now. And I was literally thrusted into the limelight, I will say, and it was exciting, but I was just like, Whoa, what's going on? I didn't understand anything. I was just, yes, yes, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, okay. And then you just have this kind of, oh my God, I just be grateful for everything everyone's saying to me and giving me, and I just need to prove. And it was just a pressurized melting pot. And that's what I carried through my career. And it's literally, that was part of my breakdown as well, because I was feeling such a sense of failure, which to other people, they were like, they were almost looking at me like, you're the most ungrateful person on this earth. <laughs> um, and I just had such a sense of I failed because it was always, this is what you need to achieve. And it was never enough once we got there. It was the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And all in my head I could think was that I have not broken the British record and I have not got a gold medal. So I'm a failure. Not thinking like, wow, I've achieved so much. And a lot of what I've done was in spite of a system that worked against me pretty much my whole career. So, so there was that. Um, and unfortunately, you know, when you are changing coach, it's so hard. Like, I think I stayed with every coach probably two years longer than I should have. Um, <laughs> because you, know, you have that loyalty, you know. And, um, yeah, researching your coaches is super important. Making sure you have the same visions and values. Making sure that you just understand what they're about and you can communicate with them which is where I struggled in America. He was a phenomenal coach, but I really struggled to communicate with him. And I felt like every time I spoke up, I just got shut down. You know, it's my way or the highway. And I learned to accept this behavior from very young. So to me, it didn't flag up as a problem because that's just it. Every time I spoke up, it's a problem. So, hey, let's just go along with it. But, you know, it had grave consequences for me. Um, so Trevor was a great coach as well. Not the coach for me. I think it was more the mentorship that I had from Jenny that kind of lent to that. Um, but again, in terms of his understanding of who I was, he understood the event amazingly and he did everything in his power that worked for Jenny, but it didn't work for me. And it's working for some youngsters now. Keely Hodgkinson's running amazing. She's just broken the world junior record indoors. But again, I'm a different kettle of, I'm a different beast. You know, my yeah. muscles yeah. are different. Um, and that is why I went to America in the first place. You know, I needed, you know, I see more of me out there than I did in the UK. Um, right. So that coaching relationship is probably one of the most important ones you'll have. That's that person that you spend so much of your time with. And they are that vehicle to help you realize your biggest, wildest dreams. And, you know, I often look at, you know, Jess Ennis and Minicello and, you know, Christine and bless his soul, Lloyd, you know, and Perry and Coach Zah. And I just thought that's how it should be. It's a partnership, yeah. you know. And, you know, one thing I remember, like my coach in America would always say, my athlete, my athlete. And I'm like, I've got a name. It's, I know you can't say Maz, because Americans can't say Maz. You'd be like Mars. I'm like, okay, stick to athlete. But, you know, it's that's that I'm higher than you. And at a certain age, it needs to be, hey, we're working together here. I think when you're young and you're still soaking up, you're a sponge, you know, you're looking to your coach and you're just, you need their expertise, but then they need to recognize when that <laughs> starts to change. And every and then for me, it was around 28 and I started to speak up and find my voice and I was like, hang on, I want to try this and I know this works. Right. Um, and then just getting told like, it's my way or the highway, you know? So 
yeah, that coaching relationship for me. I mean, I'm so happy for the lessons that I've learned because I will then share that with the next generation. And I get a lot of kids asking me, you know, they're not sure about this coach. I, I also like to facilitate kids coming out to the States. And it's all about, you know, finding the right program for you and the right coach for you before you even think about anything else. <laughs> yeah, that is so true. And I like what you said about, uh, you know, a coach needs to identify the athlete that they have. Because one thing that is so super frustrating is when you see what I call a cookie cutter coach. Like they have one program and they apply it to every athlete. It doesn't matter if they're six foot tall and, oh you know, ripped or, you know, four foot and, and, and tiny. Like they're applying the same program and that doesn't always work. And so that cookie cutter approach isn't, isn't always the way. I was lucky because like you said, uh, there is a time when you're young. And you don't understand what this sport is all about and what it takes to be great, where you do need someone who's in a authority and an and, and expert in this field to bring you to a certain point. But there is a certain point in your career where you know enough to know who you are, what your body needs through the experiences you have. And I was lucky because in the lead up to 2008, I had that kind of coach. He, he was my husband at the time. Uh, so that was helpful. He really understood me in that sense. But we yeah. were able to collaborate, you know, and that was huge because I there were certain things that I wanted to add into my program. And I truly believe that because we added those things, that's why working together as a team, we were able to achieve that medal because I changed a lot. Like it was a lot more endurance and stuff like that. And so that, like you said, is so important for an athlete. How do you know when you've reached that point where it's time for you to have an input on your career? And and if your coach gives you that pushback, like like you said, it's my way or the highway, should you just exit stage left or try and fight for it or what what should you do if you're just not getting the answers that you need to because because what were the consequences of you not putting your foot down <laughs> so to answer that it is exit stage left 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 keep going <laughs> <laughs> everything you own in a box to the left. <laughs> um no so I think for me it was when things start to go wrong you know I think I had a, my first six years were just blissful I cannot complain they're amazing it was everything I dreamt of you know let's PB every week and you know just travel the world and just doing these monster sessions and not feeling a thing and then the injuries start to trickle in and you know I was really diligent at writing my training diary in the beginning <laughs> And it was like I started to see these patterns and it was just it was things like that. Just having that half an hour every week to just go through your training diary and ask questions. I think that's so, so important. We never did that. And I remember one time I said, I think I said something like I wanted to have some input. And he's like, I know what you need and just completely shut me up. And I thought, wow, like. How do you know what I was going to say? And so for me, that was, I was about 25, 26 then. Um, and it was just, I just started taking an interest in what I was doing and wanting to know, I wanted to be able to predict, you know, my races a bit more. I felt like every time I stepped on the line, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to run 155 today or three minutes. <laughs> so, um, and I wanted to be able to say, okay, if I do this session, this is going to lead to this. The other important thing that I, you know, really want to stress is that, all my coaches were male and I feel like especially with track and field and women's sport in general we we're being coached through predominantly a male lens and we're in a, a still a kind of a man's world so when you say about the cookie cutter like for me I was doing some sessions with some coaches that they had done back in their day and you know that's great for you but uh right. My hamstrings hanging off you know maybe it was too much um and so things like that you know why do we need to do 30 runs and I was someone that I have respect for everyone um I didn't fear anyone and you know when people start saying well such and such is doing that session you should do it it doesn't ma it doesn't mean I'm gonna run well off of it you know and when people are so secretive about this stuff I'm just like so ridiculous you can what I'm doing but you pro it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you or you're going to execute it how I execute it and because I was just so different I was on this quest to figure out what worked for me what worked for Maz what made me such a great 800 runner in spite of everyone telling me that I couldn't run the 800 and the 400 
Um, and I feel like we never fully explored that or I never fully got to what I, my answers for that. And I'm, you know, still super intrigued. But um, that's some that's when I started being really inquisitive because I was so different. I was unique. And then when, you know, the powers that be start trying to, you know, critique my physique and my performances. And I just feel like, you don't know anything about me. Um, so you know, I started to be mouthy then. <laughs> yes, I, I remember that. <laughs> Charles Van Comey being one of those ones. I mean, I never forget oh, yeah. hearing, did you hear Maz Castell? You know, because no one really went up against Charles Van Comey, CVC as he was. I need those that witnesses year. to come forward because, you know, it did happen. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. But that was part of the reason. It's because you were frustrated with those types of things, like his his opinion of what you should look like and and how you should be training and all that kind of stuff and where is the line between you know because of course weight and all this stuff it matters in sport you know we're not going to get around that it, you know we can't we're not going to get around there wearing a thousand pounds there, there's got to be a range that works where's the line between giving an athlete advice and overstepping your you know <laughs> overstepping your grounds there you know how how when where would it have been appropriate for that to happen or inappropriate you know how do how do we how do we feel yeah that? i mean obviously these you know we're in a performance sport and you know if you were on the funding system like you you didn't want to leave no stone left unturned and we had evaluation sessions and we had you know things we had to turn in and so you know, in those moments, that's when you critique and that's when it's welcomed. But, you know, not when I'm just about to have one of the biggest races that you know, of my life or in the middle of a training camp and you just sort of, I think, throw really inappropriate comments. And especially when I don't have that much to do with you on a daily basis and I don't see you regularly, you don't know how I'm going to receive that. And again, what you were telling me was based off of my competitors, which was an irking point for me and you know you can't compare me to someone who is almost 20 kilos lighter than me and right. not the thing is you're saying that but I'm beating that person so why would I then change so it just for me make it make sense that's all I ask have respect yeah. and make it make sense and you know that's that's where it is it's like see the athlete not just the event see the, what, what ingredients are they bringing what have I done already what is in place and then, you know, the, the, the atmosphere will be created to well, you know, for your critique. I am someone that is so, I'm my harshest critic and I take criticism very well, but it needs to be sense. Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, there's a time and a place because, you know, just making a flippant com comment as you see an athlete running by you or just because you happen to be there that day versus sitting down, analyzing the information and the data and seeing what created what. You know, because if you were 10 pounds heavier when you did your best time, then telling someone they need to drop 10 pounds doesn't always make sense. Like you said, it has to make yeah. sense. So yeah. your, ha your hard work, your dedication, you know, the support you had coming up, all of that culminated in you actually getting medals and being at the Olympics and Commonwealth Games. And like, talk about that journey, your first competition and how that develops. I know one of your medals you got, um, at the Olympic Games was because of some of the drug cheats getting X'd out. Like, what was this? What has this journey been like as an elite athlete, despite your mom saying, <laughs> no sports for you? I mean, you've got on, you've gotten on the podium. How is that? How how has that journey as an elite athlete been for you? You know, what has the have those moments been like? Yeah, I mean that. Uh elite athlete journey is something that I'm making into a bit of a, a research project because, you know, do you really want to be elite? What is elite? Do we right. have elite athletes? I really don't think track and field professional. So, you know, yeah. I've got a career, I still need to find another career. Um, and you, we, you know, in the UK, you know, we've got this real kind of those on funding versus those off of funding. And I have enjoyed many years on funding and I've enjoyed even more years off of it. And I know that before I got on funding, I had to do a heck of a lot, you know, <laughs> to get on it. Right, um, right. So I'm very, very conscious of athlete welfare and and that pathway or the pathways that, you know, are not there really, in my opinion, or not nurturing enough or supportive enough. But for me, absolutely, I've had some incredible times and making Beijing, that will always be the most special of memories. 
I got to share an apartment with yours truly. <laughs> um, and you know, that was very powerful for me because I watched a lot and I watched you and I thought, you know, because you know, I people always ask me, well, who do you admire and who are your role models? And for me, I, I just I relate to adversity and people that really push through obstacles. And I I didn't know a whole lot. And you know, I learned so much from your interview, especially in the lead up and all the things you were carrying, but I could see just such strength in you. And then when you got your medal and I knew all the background, I thought, rah, that's like, that gave me so much hope because I knew I have to push through some sh sometimes and yeah. you can feel medal and it doesn't need to be, because people kept telling me, you need to be a certain way. You need to not smile. You need to do this. And you're not serious enough. And I was just like, well, you know what? Shit happens and you can still perform because it's about up here. So thank you. I have not ever gotten a chance to really say thank you to you, but that really gave me, and that stayed with me because I've had a lot of performances that to other people didn't make sense. Like right. who goes on 159 on their own at Lee Valley? Oh after the night before Crystal Nobody. Palace. <laughs> but it was, I wanted it. And I always remember just that focus of yours and just the elation you had afterwards. I mean, I should have been going home with a bronze medal as well from that trip, but you know, the Russians got in the way. <laughs> what the heck? So. I mean, that's one of my pet peeves, and I appreciate you um, saying what you said about about you know what I meant to you as you were coming up because man, two thousand eight, like you know, I was going through a divorce from the person that was coaching me at the games, so it was a little bit contentious. It was, a, you know, but but you know when you really want something there's that laser focus and, and like you said you have to push through and I was I think that, that was the beginning stages of the depression for me so it was a really difficult time and sometimes like you I wonder like what if I you know maybe I could have got the gold you know I still even now don't think I accomplished in my career what I should have but you know the whole experience of being an, uh, an elite athlete is super 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 um, trying because you bring yourself with you the whole way <laughs> like you just can't put, put yourself down somewhere so you can get along with no. what you gotta do right like it would be so cool if you could just take yourself hey you sit down over there while I get this train um, but that's you know that's more than myself <laughs> but you yeah. know back you know back to the the whole idea of getting your medal after this uh, I don't even know if I'm allowed. I'll just use a polite term. It pees me off. It really, really <laughs> pees me off when I see someone have to receive their medal after the fact. Because there is something about standing on that podium when it's happening, when the world is watching. There's something about um, what happens as a result of that. You, the notoriety you get, the sponsorships that we need so badly, the support we need. Like, if you go away in fifth place, and in third place, there is a completely different thing that happens when it comes to people and sponsorship and finances and the things that you could get to help you maintain the rest of your career. So it really pees me off. How did you feel when you realized that your fifth place was really a third place? Because two teams got eliminated um, from that championships, which meant you got bronze in the end. Like, Talk, talk about that before I start cursing out. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go some water or tequila, whichever one. Um, do you know what? It's funny listening to you say that because fifth, that number five, for some, four is my favorite number, but fifth place as a really is a sore spot for me because I've had three medals back in retrospect. Um, the first was Beijing, but it didn't happen in that order. So the first one I got back was from an indoors in 2011 Paris and I finished fifth and two Russians cheated. So then Jenny and I were upgraded. She came first and I was third. So that could have been an amazing podium moment gone. Um, then Beijing, I found out when I was um, the year before I returned from America, like in 2016, and it took so long to actually become official. And so we had you know, if there is a plan B, it was incredible. We got to go to the London Stadium and get given our medals there. And again, that was a fifth to third upgrade. And then for me, 2012, I finished fifth, horrible, disastrous race. Um, but there was no upgrade. There was no championship after that for me. And I think, you know, had I had this sort of trajectory of, you know, maybe in 2011, my contract with Adidas was, you know, winding down. That could have been, you know, a solidifier for me. That would have been a medal. 
um, you know, having an Olympic medal to your name definitely helps, you know, when, when it comes to selectors. So that rap sheet that I have now, going into 2012, it was so easy for them to say, well, you know, she goes, and this is exactly what they said, but she doesn't perform. I'm not a performer. I'm not a medal contender, you know. And so that's where it really hurts because it's stolen moments I always talk about. And, you know, it really, it, it's, you know, every bleak word under the sun. But then I just have to use that pain for a purpose. And I think when I stood on the podium in 2019, I think it was, and got that bronze medal, I thought, I'm enough. I've always been enough. And that's good enough for me. <laughs> so it did a lot for me and my internal confidence because, you know, as a people pleaser and, you know, always trying to prove myself, it was suddenly like, actually, the only person that matters is you. And we're going to go from there. And wow, I look at that medal all the time. It makes me so happy. And that's what I've been chasing. And I've got it without even running to them, like any meters. <laughs> right. <laughs> I love it. So, you know, and it makes me think about, I'm always thinking about like happiness and we always say, oh, I just want to be happy. I've always said that ever since I was a child. I just want to be happy one day. You know, what does that mean? And it's actually, it's not about things, you know, at all. It's the connection, the environment we're in and it's that internal peace and being able to do the things that are going to bring you those feelings of contentment. So, um, yeah, running has taught me so much. <laughs> Oh, tell me about it. Tell me about it. You said that 2012 was one of your most traumatic years, though. I mean, happiness was not around. What was going on that year? Was it because of everything with, you know, your contract with sponsorship or was it the team or was it life outside? What was what was going on that made 2012 such a rough spot? I guess it was just the pressure of a home games and we were kind of yeah. warned about it and I didn't really I just you just everything was building up to that it's the London games and we were told whoever gets a medal from this is you know we know what happens if you got a medal from 2012 um and so much pressure so so much pressure but it was the first time I you know I was quite naive throughout the sport to be honest um but it was the first time I really understood the power of politics in sport oh. and prejudice and, you know, and I, for a long time, just blamed myself for everything. And actually it's taken quite a lot of processing and understanding and letting, trying to let things go and being like, okay, things happen. And actually sometimes there are going to be, pre there's going to be discrimination. And, you know, as athletes, we try and control as much as we can, but some things you know, unfortunately, that trials didn't go to plan. And I that was my only way of controlling anything. And so once that was left out to the, <laughs> the powers that be, um, it unfortunately didn't go my way. But however, you know, going into, you know, all the, the nitty gritty, it was just like, okay, well, actually, let me see this for what it really is. And, you know, right. ultimately, you don't ruffle the feathers at the top. <laughs> right, right. It's true, because you have someone's you know, I used to always tell athletes that were around me at the same time, like, just don't ruffle any feathers because these are the people who are deciding your fate. And they literally can decide whether you live or die in this sport, because when it comes to selection, they can make up any reason why they're not going to take you. So, you know, even if you, you're the best, they can find a way to. <laughs> I mean, I think it was a massive statement that, you know, they would rather take one place for our most competitive event um, overtaking three girls just, you know, to spite me. So, um, and, and it looked crazy at the championships as well. So I'm really passionate about governance and, you know, good governance and best practice and bringing that back to sport because yeah. they are crushing dreams. <laughs> and that, that's uh, the thing, you know, I, 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 I often hear people saying you're imagining it. You know, it's not, there's not really you know, that would have happened no matter whether the athlete was black or white. But so so how can people identify? Because sometimes I it's very clear to people who have experienced discrimination what yeah. it looks like and how it pans out. But it can be so subtle that people on the outside just think you're crazy. Right. Oh, yeah. So what what is that like? Like when you know <laughs> something fishy is going on here? <laughs> that don't smell right. Um, <laughs> um, 
it's things like, you know, and people are just like, oh my God, that happened. But, you know, getting emails and that say you need to come first to be considered for the team. Was everybody getting those emails? I think not, because I will ask my, you know, counterparts and allies and they're not getting that. And the only difference is the color of our skin. Um, so, you know, it's just, you know, when people, you know, racism in sport is very real. Like when people ask you, where are you really from? <laughs> That's just, you know, a microaggression that shows that it is real. Um, and from the get-go, look at it. I was not supposed to be an 800 runner for them. That is not, you know, they would send me on camps and tell me I was wasting money if I didn't want to go. And I was like, but these altitude camps are not for me. <laughs> Right. You know, I appreciate, you know, I'm not Kenyan, I'm West African and I have the somatotype of, of a sprinter. So altitude that high, my muscles are not getting oxygen, um, but it would be such a big debacle and it works for every other 800 runner in the country and distance girl. And it was just like, no one ever wanted to just take time to see what worked for Maz. Why were you able to run so fast over the eight, four and the eight? You know, all the VO2 testings. I remember one time the guy telling me, oh, well, according to this, you should be running 210. I was like, well, I run 158, so <laughs> chuck that in. <laughs> um, you know, being put on diets. Sorry, like these Niger genes, like. <laughs> they work <laughs> you know, differently. Don't be silly. Um, and often, a lot of the time, it was like, oh, my gosh, you weigh this. Oh, but you don't, you know, you don't look that heavy. Right. And how am I moving? Like, is it impacting me? Obviously, is it my time of the month? Um, is it winter? <laughs> you know, it was just getting compared to someone who, you know, I'm saying someone, but girls that were completely nothing like me. So, um, yeah, it was it was just so, so much. <laughs> So you you went through a lot, but you also had a lot of success. If now with hindsight, with wisdom, with knowledge, with all that, when you look back at your career, what would would there be anything you would have changed or done differently? I mean, I know you said you uh, had coaches you probably would have left a little bit sooner. Were there any other <laughs> things that you would do differently? Because I think people can learn from, you know, your experience and what you would change if you were to go through your career again. Yeah. Definitely. I think one of my biggest things I'm trying to work on is communication. Um, and I just, you know, it's how I was raised. It was like, don't speak unless you've got something <laughs> to say. But I would ask so many more questions. I would chew your ear off. I would, you know, like, you know, for me, I just, I'm obsessed with mentoring. Like, I think having a mentor is just one of the most powerful things ever. And even if it's not necessarily in what you're literally doing or your specific area of expertise just having that person to give you that outside perspective is so important and sometimes when they're removed from sport or whatever your career is it's even better mm -hmm. um but just being able to communicate my thoughts and feelings as well and speaking up you know I feel like I really found my voice after I got an Olympic bronze medal and that that's a whole lot you know time yeah. where I was not saying how I felt and what I wanted to do so um, and just making sure I surrounded myself with uh, the people that made me feel good about myself more you know I spent a lot of time isolating myself and I think I should have just spent more time with the people that made me enjoy the sport because that is the biggest takeaway I have like I've made some incredible incredible friends for life you know like yourself doesn't matter where we are in the globe doesn't matter how long we haven't spoken it's just you know like old times. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Absolutely. So what are you up to now, Mazzy Maz? I mean, I know it's been a journey, but where are you now? I know the transition financially, even yeah. throughout our career is is, a, is is serious financially after your career, you know, because you always think, oh, I'm going to make it. And then that, that's going to be set for life. But, you know, most of us end up having to work or borrow money from somewhere. So, you know, you say that's everyone thinking that, you know, you just super rich after you finish your yeah. career but for most athletes that's not the case so what's what's going on with you now darling 
Yeah, so when the penny finally drops, like, hang on, I mean, I don't have to live like this, <laughs> like, scrimping and saving. Um, you know, I started to, you know, I think I texted you or I Instagrammed you, like, how do you know when it's time to retire? You sure did, <laughs> yeah. you sure did. I've just been fighting it for so long, and I thought, you know what, I'm just, I think I'm done. But let me give it, I did think I did 21 days prayer and fasting the beginning of this, of January. And I just, I just gave my permission to, gave myself permission to say it's okay that I don't want to run anymore and I'm not going to compete obviously everything with Tokyo had a huge impact on that because up until September I was you know still trying to train and come back but it's really lonely I was doing it on my own you know shout out to Tamsin over in Australia she was giving me some input and you know I just I just didn't want to you know what it takes we know what it takes to get back on that line and I just had enough and I think I was starting to be pulled in different directions um, and I'm just you know big advocate on athlete welfare and I was thinking okay let me see how I navigate this transition thing and I've connected with some great people um, and you know the more you connect the more you speak you're like people are like oh yeah that's a problem that's a problem but uh, it's not enough to just know for me I like to you know be a change maker okay how are we going to change this <laughs> I'm a campaigner so I'm on this crusade this mission, um, just to align with people that, you know, are on the same wavelength as me and want to see change in our sport. There's so much that needs to happen in, in track and field. So that's why I'm at, um, in terms of that, I'm working with a company called Future Proof who uh, suddenly put this idea that I could work in corporate. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> I don't do numbers or finance, but I, I like to work with people. So, you know, we're looking at roles in sort of the human resources or the people department, you know, um, recruitment or management consultancies and that kind of thing. So that's quite exciting. And just going through the process and you never know. Um, I currently work with a charity supporting the homeless community here in Wigan, which is such a, you know, a purposeful job. Um, no days are the same. But again, you know, once when I do this job, I think of athletes. I'm like, man, this is what I want to do for athletes. So, you know, just that supportive role, um, but also thinking from a person centered asset based perspective and making sure that, you know, it's more than one thing they need to really thrive. You know, right, obviously right. people think, OK, you provide them with a bed. But let me tell you something. The bed is the last thing that they literally ask for. You know, there's so many things that need sorting out. So, um, yeah, I'm just on this little mission to sort of get a full-time job whilst working on my side hustles. I've got a new project coming out soon, which is with my passion of mentoring as well. Um, so watch this space. I'm teaming up with another run I used to run with. So that's very exciting. But again, it's like, um, you know, mentoring is so, so important to me. So yeah, just, doing lots of stuff and actually with this transition journey what I notice as well we wear so many hats as an athlete you know you might be going to schools you might be speaking you might be doing PT all that stuff so when I like when people ask me what do you want to do I'm like I don't know I do, I'm just, I do a bit, I don't know <laughs> just maybe <laughs> right, um, but I feel like through this process as I've done some like personality tests and career profiling and learning you know how my CV should look for different, you know, jobs and applications. This governance course I'm doing has been so, so good as well. Um, so I feel like I'm gradually whittling it down. And I think it would be nice to have a bit of a blueprint to sort of give athletes. So they don't have to right. be all over. Yeah, I was going to say, what what tips would you give, you know, how on how to transition well from sport if you were, you know, talking to someone who's just about to sort of leave the sport or maybe at the beginning of their career because sometimes we we should have been thinking about this at the beginning so knowing what you know now what are some tips you'd give to transition well from sports to quote unquote the real world yeah so I've been doing some sort of um research for a, a company that's sort of taking off at the minute called brand new sport and something I read on their website when I was researching them was start with the end in mind um, which I just think was so powerful because yeah. we don't. <laughs> Our end is medals and we're forever perpetually just chasing that and, you know, PBs and when we get there, we just want more, 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 more. Um, but, you know, we are transitioning throughout our career and, you know, it would have done no harm for me to be doing some of these courses alongside my training, you know, but it's having that guidance, you know, so definitely like that mentor is so, so powerful and, you know, 
speak to me, speak to Tash. Like there's people that have been where you're trying to go that can help you through that journey. And it, it doesn't have to be like a big commitment. It can just be a one email or one off chat. You know, the world of social media now makes things so easy to connect. Um, and, you know, set yourself some really clear goals and timeframes. I don't think I really did that. You know, I think if someone had told me I was going to wait until 2021 to retire, I'd have been like, you're crazy. <laughs> right. um, so, yeah, just really kind of align yourself with your vision for the sport. And if you can't do it on your own, find someone that will help you do that, because in every other career, that's what they do. Um, and then you almost will help you know when to when transition time is coming and when you should be sort of having a backup plan rather than being in crisis. Right. Oh my God, man. Oh my God, this, you know. And I felt like I was just recovering from crisis after crisis and it's exhausting. So yeah. we want to prevent, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, darling, as you know, I could talk to you forever and we definitely need to talk more often, you know, in person because I'm realising sure. now, you know, social media is not like really not it, is it? <laughs> great conversation. Like you're like, oh, like, 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 but, you know, true conversation is really necessary, especially at this time. But as you know, because I know you have seen some stuff, I like to finish my interviews with a little game of this or that, darling. So. <laughs> I think I, so you ready yes all right so I think I know the answer to this one but singing or running singing baby <laughs> iPhone or Android Android ambassador oh you're the first Android I love it me too I was just waiting finally now I know we truly are sisters <laughs> <laughs> ambassador <laughs> slash mentor so ambassador slash mentor or athlete oh why are you gonna do me like that <laughs> i knew i'd get you with that one mentor and ambassador love it yeah. this is a big one boyfriend or bentley bentley all day <laughs> wait wait for it <laughs> Bentley. Y'all think I'm joking. Can you I see? Love it. What does it say? <laughs> dogs over dudes? Hell dogs yeah. Dogs over dudes, I love it. She has a, she has a couple of dogs. <laughs> I love it. And my final question, you know I'm going Oprah for Winfrey on you. What do you want the world to know, Mass? About me or just in general? Sorry. In general, whatever about you whatever comes to I mind. want the world to know that love and kindness is out there for everyone each and every one of us can have love and kindness and it starts inside you I love it I love it you know Maz I I'm so proud of you and everything you've been through and everything you've come through and accomplished despite the journey that you've had. I'm so, so proud of you and I love you so much. And I'm so grateful that you've come to chat to us today. I think the world needs to know. And so I'm just really happy for you and I'm looking forward to seeing where the journey takes you next. If people want to follow your journey and see what you're up to and see what causes you're supporting or help you support those causes, how do they find you? Yeah, thank you. There's so much coming up. So on Insta, you want to see this pretty mug? Um, the girl underscore Okoro, the girl underscore Okoro, but you can also just put Marilyn Okoro and most of my socials will come up. So I'm pretty active on Instagram, Twitter, again, Emma Okoro4 or Marilyn Okoro. And let's link up on LinkedIn as well, because, you know, that's the professional one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely it's trying to be professional. <laughs> I love it. Well, darling, it's been such a pleasure. I'm sure. Um, oh, you're gonna thanks be so much, Tasha. Love professional. you. Love you too. And we'll talk soon. Bye, sweetheart. Take care, nobles. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Oh my gosh. As you guys know, I said it right from the beginning. I love that woman. She just, you know, she's not just a great athlete, um, but she has really stood up for the rights of, of others. She truly, truly, genuinely cares about others. And it shows, you know, it's one thing to bear, care about others and kind of just be in the background. She actively tries to make sure that others are OK through the causes that she she works with and for. And I'm just so happy to see her uh, flourishing. Uh, she's She's been through a lot. So 
that was really exciting for me. I hope it was really exciting for you too. So much to offer. Make sure like if you want to know more about transitioning in sport, you want to know about getting through mental health issues, get in touch with Maz, connect with her. She's connected to a lot of great organizations or connect with us here at Global Sports Channel. Now, do not forget to like, share, follow, all of that good stuff, uh, right? And make sure you comment and let us know how you enjoyed this episode or if anything really stood out for you. And of course, do not forget to go to www.globalsportschannel.com. Well, this has set my day up well. <laughs> I hope it set yours up too. See you next time.